It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! Yeah! <laughs> this week, starring our very special guest, Mr. Ronan Chris Murphy! <laughs> Uh, welcome. Thank you. It's always <laughs> awesome to be here. Thank you, fake band. Thank you, fake audience. And thank you, Ronan, Ronan for showing up on time. And thank you, real audience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's look at the real audience. Uh, there they are. Nice. Okay. So, um, we are in pre-rally, uh, road rally hell around here. <laughs> I am wired on caffeine today just in case you couldn't tell. Uh, I just had like the head guy of a really awesome music library call me saying that they want to run listings with us. Like, can't talk, I'm too wired, gotta go. <laughs> but I will talk to him tomorrow. Um, welcome to all you guys in the audience. Let's see, who do we have? Peter, Bluesman, Rob Green. Ooh, some new names in there. Brad Ro Roseboro. Um, Jesse, yeah, the usual cast of characters, and I do mean characters. So, um, you know, Ronan probably does the show twice a year, and he is beloved by you guys because he gives really straight-ahead answers to engineering and production questions. Uh, I'll give you a little bio real quick. As a producer, engineer, and or mixer, Ronan Chris Murphy has worked with the likes of King Crimson on several albums, Steve Morse, Dixie Dregs, Deep Purple, Terry Bozio, uh, Zappa Missing Person, Steve Stevens, Tony Levin, uh, Martin Sexton, Jane, Jamie Walters, Oliver, don't know Oliver, the guitar, California Guitar Trio, can't even pronounce this one, <laughs> Chuco Valdez. Chucho Valdez, he grew Val up in from Cuba. Ah, I'll, I'll practice that. <laughs> John La, La Barbera, yeah. um, who's played with the Philip Glass Ensemble, and Steve Reich, uh, Nels Klein from Wilco, as well as various side projects involving members of Tool, Ministry, Weezer, Dishwalla, and yes, um, he's extremely popular at the Road Rally. People are usually like out the door for your classes, which is a good thing. A good and thing. Uh, I just got an email, I think like four or five days ago, from somebody saying, or no, I saw a post on Facebook. Somebody said, yeah, don't miss Ronan's class. Awesome. So don't miss Ronan's class at the Road And Rally. you've got me in the theater again, which is yes. awesome. I love being in there. Not only can I fit more people, yeah. but I have audio playback. Yes. It's so much better to be able to talk about these concepts and say, look, here it is in this example, in this style of music, and here it is this style of music. So I the love room. that. I love that. He's talking about we have a 200-seat theater in the hotel that's like a Hollywood screening room. It's very dead. It's like a, a small movie theater. Yeah. But yeah. it's really intimate. And, yeah, it's uh, a beautiful place to do classes. Yeah, classes. and we put a Bose L1 or L2 system in there so it sounds good. So we're stoked. And I've got to tell you guys, um, just so you know, if you're registered for the Road Rally and you want to go to the mentor lunches, they are more than two-thirds sold out at this point, And the tickets have only been on sale for a couple of days. So uh, go to Taxi and click the Road Rally link and find your way to the mentor lunches. Um, what else can I tell you other than the Road Rally has come together spectacularly well this year. And we're doing some really exciting stuff. So... Um, that's it. On with the show. Yeah. I'm going to talk very little today, if that's possible. <laughs> I'm so wired on caffeine. <laughs> I've been drinking rock stars like crazy. Um, and I am going to, it's Ask Ronan Anything Day. So I'm going to hit uh -oh. you guys uh, <laughs> with the questions that came in on Facebook. Yep. And you might as well read them because they're sitting in front of All you. Right. And I'm going to let him answer those. He's got some that have come in from elsewhere. Okay. And um, here we go. Awesome. Uh, how do you deal with mixing mastering when you're under a time crunch? You just get it done. And this, I mean, this is a weird thing. And I think one of the big disappoint, you know, one of the unfortunate things is there's less real deadlines than there used to be. And that kind of sounds a little weird to say because there's so much of like, you know, people working at home. like, Oh, I got this song I'm working on and it goes on and on. And I'm not criticizing because my own personal projects are so far behind. But there's few things that make you better and improve your craft at something than real deadlines. Right. Because when you're working on a label project, like, OK, this has got to be on shelves by Christmas or yeah. this has to be in the final mix for this TV show by Thursday afternoon. You have there no is, choice. There isn't. And yeah. there's. There's almost nothing that'll improve your craft better than real deadlines. 
And that's whether you're mixing, mastering, even songwriting. You know, you can sit around for two years working on a song, and then there's like, this has got to be delivered Monday morning, and it's Sunday night, and it's amazing how fast all of a sudden, like, oh, yeah, I'm walking down this, hip, boom, and it just starts coming out. We hear that from members all the time, that they're very appreciative of the deadlines for the listings because it forces yeah. them to finish. But I guess to answer the real question is really focus on the big stuff. You know, people get so tied up into like, oh, this little cool flanging effect I wanted to do on the hi-hat. And I don't want to dismiss that, but, you know, it's so easy today, especially since we have a million options in the DAW, to mm -hmm. start running down these rabbit holes. And when you you and I came up, it's sort of like, okay, I got 16 tracks, I got these faders, there's two compressors and one reverb. Right. We're making a record. Oh, you've been to my studio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and those were the pretty nice studios that we'd get to work yeah. out of a lot. So it sort of forced you to have a working method where you really focused on the important stuff. So focus, focus on, is the vocal melody and melody cutting through? Does it, is it big and powerful? You know, is it exciting? And gone all the tiny minutia, you know, you'd kind of, eh, you didn't have time for that. And so when you're in a crunch, that's it. Just like really strip down and focus. And, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that there's a lot of some of the biggest mixers in the world, I think, you know, I've never worked with Chris Lord Algae, but, you know, some friends who have said he's knocking out two to three songs a day. And wow. this is probably the most successful mixer to ever walk planet Earth. He gets paid by the mix, not by the hour. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and he's cranking out hits by the minute. Yeah. So it's one of those things where you think, oh, God, I need to go in and automate every little consonant and things like that. That's one approach to it, but that's not really something that's required for success. When you have, again, some of the most successful mixers in the world who can knock out a couple songs a day. Right. So that's the big thing, the long-winded way to say, focus on the big things. Yeah. And even just go in and just get rid of stuff. If there's something problematic that's just not, you know, integral to, you know, the, the spirit of the song or something, well, toss it and last probably improve time, your whole mix anyway. Last time you were here, you gave out maybe the most profound advice you've ever given out on one of these shows, which is... There's a lot of stuff on your, you know, in your tracks that you just don't need. Yeah, absolutely. And that will make your make your mix better by just getting rid of all the excess crap. <laughs> Focus on the big stuff. Yep. All right. What's the so next, next one, one you've got there? Do you always compress everything at the end of a mix, or do you find that sometimes you don't need it at all? From Catnip Pat. Hope I'll get to see you at the rally again. Always nice to see you, Pat. Yo, Pat. Um, I compress a lot of stuff, yeah. and it's one of the big mis Go, going in or mixing. It, it kind of depends on the instrument, but mm -hmm. at some point, um, my golden rule for compression for lesser experienced people is: when in doubt, don't. Mm -hmm. You can always do more later. If you compress something on the way in and you do it badly, you You're can't stuck. really undo it. Right. So when in doubt, don't. I've been doing this a long time, so I'm mostly confident. But even sometimes I get kind of unsure. Like, oh man, is this? <laughs> You know, am I going to screw this up? Um, but a lot of stuff gets compressed. Big primary stuff gets compressed. Vocals always compressed. Mm -hmm. Bass almost always compressed. Uh, electric guitars with distortion are already compressed, usually right. by virtue of the, tubes the distortion, and, yeah. the tubes, and all of that. So I would say, in terms of the individual elements, probably 60% of the things. Are compressed. And are you talking compression or limiting just to, you know, wipe out peaks? Um, to me, compression, a lot of people think about compression like, oh, here's this limiter thing. Oh, here's a peak. I need to wipe that out. You know, if it's just about wanting levels to go up and down, don't use a compressor. Right. You know, use some kind of gain control. I'm using compression because I want the sound of it. I want the right. character of the compression. I want the tone shaping. You know, and one of those things I talk about in my classes is we love compression because, like as a mixer, it lets us play God. We can change the rhythmic feel of something. We can make something feel forward or make back. We can make it feel bigger or smaller. Yeah. So compression is just like this massive, incredible tone shaping tool. And, you know, really compressed music is, compressed music just sounds more professional. When it's done well, compressed music sounds more professional than uncompressed music. And, you know, people can get into esoteric debates about that one way or the other. Yes, and, they do. <laughs> and neither side is wrong in terms of what pleases them more. Right. But for the most part, music that is, doesn't have a fair amount of compression. And I'm not talking about like crazy, insane limiting that distorts masters and all that. But just, you know, Sgt. Pepper is an insanely compressed record. You know, people think, yeah. oh, God, comp you're compressing everything now. It's like, yeah, now, like from the mid-60s. Yeah, so, well... 
Um, and, and the flip side I would add is like when I would work on a jazz project, mm -hmm. I would use very little because mm -hmm. you want stuff to breathe and you want the air of the room and exactly. you play the instruments. But for pop radio, yeah. if everything else is compressed, you have to be compressed or you sound unprofessional. Yeah, but but even on its own, like, and I'm not saying the difference of like smash crazy loudness war stuff, Yeah. but really like compression is like, oh wow, that vocal sounds so rich and dynamic. Yeah. Now, people, <laughs> people, uh, funny thing is people will describe uh, uncompressed things is not being dynamic yeah. when really it's just the opposite. Yeah. But that's a really important thing and I encourage you like if you're working on your own stuff trying to develop your craft f spend a lot of time woodshedding compression. What's a good ear training exercise to learn what compression does? You're talking about tone shaping yeah. with compression and, and we've been through it. We know that it's mm -hmm. countless hours of experimentation mm -hmm. but if you have a home studio and yep. you're alone what would you recommend that they do? That's a do? really good question. Um, and uh, I'm going to have a course available online about this later. Okay. It's not done yet. But one of the things, get a good flexible compressor. Uh, and that could even be something like an emulation of an 1176 or something right. where you've got an attack and release. And just run stuff through it. Drums are a really good thing to do this. A yeah. drum overhead mic or a snare drum or something. Just take the attack, like set the ratio pretty high so it's doing a lot. Slow attack. Fast attack, slow attack. Watch how your transients change. Watch right. how front to back depth perception changes. So just really back and forth, back and forth. And with the attack times, it's about transients and transients is where we get presence, articulation, clarity, detail. So faster you go, the more of that stuff you're gonna shave off. Slower you go, the more of that's gonna come through. Right. So really just that, back and forth. Spend a whole day, run a drum through it, run a vocal through it, run a banjo through it. So would you always set the threshold um, low enough so that it's always kicking? Yeah, so I mean, especially for learning, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, and then just the same thing with release times. Mm -hmm. Release times are less obvious about what it's doing until you really know what to listen for. Yeah. Attack times are pretty easy. You can go, wow, that snare drum's hitting me in the head. Oh, that <laughs> snare drum is tucked back and mellow. Yeah. But, you know, with the release times, again, just play with that. Go to the extremes. And are we talking 20 minutes or are we talking 20 hours of I'm, playing with it? I'm talking 20 years. Yeah. Really. I mean, well, this is, <laughs> but, but I would. I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, it's like photography or but, something where but it's a lifetime. A whole, but, but, but spend a whole day on it or even just, you know, spend, if you're in the studio a lot, spend 20 minutes a couple times a week. Yeah. Because it's one of those things where eventually you start to feel compression. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking about it academically about what I want to do this, but it's like, oh, I want the track to feel more this way. And you kind of intuitively start to know that. I was never smart enough to think of it academically. <laughs> yeah. For me, it was literally turn things and when it sounded good, remember what I had done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and after a while, it sticks. But that's the thing, just really like attack, you know, and set your ratio is kind of high just so it's doing a lot. Your threshold kind of low. You know, like a six to one? Six, ten, okay, 20. Okay, way up there. Way yeah, up actually, there. Actually, I mean, okay. when I'm demonstrating this in some of my live courses, we do like a 20 to one ratio, knocking down like 20 dB of compression. Yeah. Really extreme because you want to hear the artifacts. You want to hear yeah. this in a dramatic way. And that's not how you're always going to use it. But you, when you start to hear that, oh, that's that thing that really fast attack does. Then you go, oh yeah, I'd like to bring a little bit of this to my acoustic guitar track. Or so I then you might go for that. a four to one or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you know what the artifacts are, but you know it's, that you don't need to be so incredibly obvious. Yeah, but really this is one thing. Spend time practicing compression. It's it's one of the major things that really differentiates like the big dogs from everybody else. Mm -hmm. Is mastering compression. I would say is, aside from you know, things like understanding arrangement, I think mastering compression is probably more important than anything else you could learn as a mixer. Um, uh, is it a fair statement to say you're not going to learn it in a week or a month? No. Uh, you, you could learn a lot in a week and yeah. get to know it more and do it more and more. But I, you know, I wasn't joking when I said 20 years. I mean, yeah. I, I've been making records for over 20 years, and I still have discoveries yeah. about... <gasps> Oh, that's when because you get more into the deal. Oh, that's how you know ELOP, electro optical style, like LA2A right. style things. Oh, that's how they respond to these real when a guy plays guitar like checka 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 versus that finger style guitar. Ah, and so mm -hmm. I'm constantly learning it. And really, it's and it's also one of those things that's really constant discovery for me. Like, yeah. I, I kind of I know it, I understand it, but there's su such constant discovery of like, oh, that's. This just don't, but now that makes sense. That's why I used to have the trouble with that, all of those things.
I was having dinner with Jeff Emmerich before the road rally a couple of years ago, and I asked him, you know, how many years of learning did it take you till you felt like a Jedi? And he goes, I'm still learning. Yeah. I learn every time I sit down. Yeah. And we all are. Yeah. And the good thing is, you know, I, aside from making records and stuff, I have these sort of side businesses of teaching about this stuff. And teaching kind of forces you to have to have a better understanding of what's actually going on. Because yeah, you know, you need to figure out ways to explain that, and it's amazing how much, uh, you know, I learned just from having figure out how to explain this. Because you can't really charge somebody money to go, you know, just kind of eh, like that until it feels like, eh. yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so uh, I had to start to really start to understand. Okay, attack times. Here's how they relate to transients, and here's how. But they have the luxury oh. with home studios to do yeah. this now. You Absolutely. know, I mean, 25, 30 years ago, you were sitting in a three hundred dollar an hour room, yeah. and you can't have that experimentation time on somebody else's dime. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of times when the session was over, there was somebody coming in behind yep. you, mm -hmm. so you didn't have an hour to screw around and figure it out. Yeah. So. You guys have it better than we did. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is a short and a long one. Would you discuss a mid-side processing, when to use it, and how to use it effectively? So can we run this for a few hours? Or yeah. <laughs> I mean, you and I have talked about this a little bit before, and I know the short answer but, to it that you and I agree on. But, but the short answer is most things you're going to deal with on a day-to-day, -day, you don't need to do it. It's kind of one of those you know, fancy terms that people like learn on the internet and want to start using because it seems kind of cool and fancy and Jedi. And there's nothing wrong with that. Learn, what was the, learn. the jazz label where they used to go direct to disc? Um, it was somebody out of like Minneapolis, I want to say, not tell our I know Baker's the one or, you're talking about. Yeah. yeah and, and they used to use a lot of mid side stuff, but those were esoteric yeah. direct to, they would literally go right <laughs> exactly. to the mastering way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great for that. Do it. But yeah. for a rock record, would you yeah. ever use MS? More than, more than I ever would have expected. Really? But still, I think it's one of those things where, you know, again, I'm mastering at kind of a more elite level than your average home studio guy. Yeah. Um, but the, the thing about MS mid side, for those who don't understand is what we're doing is, it will sort of split off a signal instead of left to right, split it off center to sides. So you can process um, the center information different from the side information. And I almost never use that in, never use it in tracking, almost never use it in mixing, but I do use it in mastering. Because a lot of times you'll have a situation where, like say for instance, oh. you have a very sibilant vocal. Mm -hmm. It would be a real big problem. And so you, you have to end up DSing the whole mix so all of a sudden when you do that, it's bringing all that high end down. Right. So your guitars are now starting to pump up and down and creates a problem. And um, so what you can do is go into MS mode, do DSing just on the center channel information. So that will start to pull down, but your vocal, your guitars panned out to the sides will uh, still be, you know, I've, all be the consistent. Years I've been doing, well, not that I still make records, but I've never heard that technique explained before, and that sounds brilliant, because you're right. The only things that are going to be down the middle, generally speaking, are going to be the kick drum, the bass, yeah. the snare, and the vocal, and yep. maybe a hi-hat. Yeah, and it's one of those things in mastering that I've been using, and uh, sometimes, too, if you want to brighten up, say, guitars or something to get the things to sort of sound wider and you know more exciting on the top, but especially if you have a female vocal or you know, something recorded on a cheaper condenser that can already be kind of harsh and sibilant in the middle, I can go into MS mode and boost up like the high end on the sides, which will sort of expand the width of something without kind of fancy phasey tricks uh, and not go in and run the risk of making my vocal too harsh or, or sibilant. So tell them <clears throat> when you're mastering, how would you... When you do MS in the studio, it's how you set the capsules. Yeah. You bring it up on three faders, and it's the relationship of the two, the left and right fader, which are the outer ones versus the... Life is way easier than when you and I started. Okay, so yeah, um, how do you do it now? Is there a knob? Yeah, there's plugins that you can switch over from left to right to uh, MS mode. Okay. And, I mean, the one's a bunch... The company Plugin Alliance sells, like, the Brainworks stuff and uh, SPL. A lot of their stuff has the option of MS... Uh, there's a, a processor called a Clarifonic from Cush Audio that I use a lot that you can switch into MS. So these days, it's built into the plugin. Is it a dangerous rabbit hole for a rookie? I mean, people are going to hear this, you know, they've yeah. only been working in a home studio for two years, and they're just starting to get to the point where they've got a reasonably good command of their world. It, it, this sounds horribly dangerous to me for them 
yeah. to try MS in a mastering scenario. Yeah, I wouldn't only... get in. I wouldn't get into it. Really, I I was a full time pro for about twenty years before I started using MS stuff on a somewhat okay. regular basis. Yeah, and the thing is, for the most part, you don't need it. Most of the things you're going to deal with, you don't need it. But mm -hmm. of course, the problem is you go on the internet and look for information, which I guess technically you're doing right now. Um, and so you I know, heard. you'll say, hey, you know, I'm trying to get my snare drum to be X, Y, and people will chime in with the fanciest words they know, which are usually MS processing or multiband, something right. or another, when really the answer is usually, oh, yeah, pull back a little 2K. With a standard simpler, EQ or simpler is better. Like Back off the reverb or push a little up here. Yeah. But yeah, the MS side, I, I don't encourage or discourage anyone from going and learning as much stuff as possible. But MS, you, you could easily live your entire life without touching it at all. Right. And make amazing, great sounding records. And really, where I use it the most these days is, you know, mastering when I'm trying to That's prob problem solve yeah. for things that come in from around the world that aren't the best mixes across the board all the time. Or, it's funny, or back in my day, you, uh, you know, um, Rudy was his name, the guy that did those. Van Gelder. Yeah, Rudy Van Gelder was the king of like MS uh, on a jazz record live to disc. Um, I, I used it like 1% of the time, yep. but it would be like if I were doing, uh, you know, an 80 to 100 piece orchestra in a huge hall, yep. a cathedral or something. I might pop up a pair of MS mics and raise them and lower them yeah. using a pulley and finding the sweet spot yeah. in the room and then screw around with my MS and go, wow, that sounds amazing. But I would never, ever mix it in with everything live. I would keep it on its own pair yep. of tracks, you know, and, yeah. and later. And usually bring it up a little, bring it up a little and go, okay, I've now given it too much. You back it down, you can barely hear it. Yeah, so, eh. yeah. and the short of that is, you know, when we could easily spend an hour talking about MS miking, but at a miking thing, and I, I always teach it a lot because I like it because it's a stereo technique that's easy to turn into a mono mm -hmm. technique in the mix. Um, that that probably went over your head if you don't know stereo miking techniques. But well, it's do, a way do, do people even have a mono button anymore? Yeah. <laughs> you know, when they're they working should, on They should. They should because it's, mono is more and more important. You know, people's i their iPads and iPhones where so many people are listening to stuff. Yeah, is is mono. So mono is becoming extremely important again. I it's told always you my, been important. But my teenage daughter said to me when she was fifteen, "Why do they make bother making two earbuds? All my friends and I listen with one. <laughs> exactly. One gets the guitar, one gets the keyboard. Yeah, broke my heart. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Why would a home recordist and DAW user who does everything in the box and has taken a course in mastering send his songs to a dedicated mastering house or engineer? Good question, Craig. Um, the, uh, the thing about mastering is mastering is a person. Mm -hmm. Really, mastering is a thing where you're sending it off to somebody who's done a lot of work uh, with with mastering and understands audio hopefully at a deeper more advanced level than you have so it's sending it off to a second set of ears uh to be able to maybe massage it a little for tone but also to just be able to spot where there might be trouble frequencies about how things are going to translate um you know to know that oh yeah this little build up here in the low end that may sound really groovy with your subwoofer but it's going to wreak havoc right. on the people who are going to listen on their phone or off their tv uh, or in a different set of speakers. So a big thing is to send it to somebody else in a different room, in a different mixing environment. Who specializes. Who specializes and, and can bring in kind of that perspective. So, you know, if you're doing stuff and your stuff sounds amazing and translates really well across multiple systems, <laughs> great. You've got everything, uh, everything you need. But the reason so many people in the world do it is to send it off to somebody else to look at it with a fresh set of ears right. in a different monitoring environment with, you know, especially these days with everybody doing so much themselves, uh, you know, somebody with more experience to know that, oh, this is going to create problems. I mean, uh, you know, I do a lot of mastering for people, but I was a full-time pro for over 15 years before I kind of felt comfortable saying, oh yeah, this is something I can do for you. You know, I, I never felt I had quite developed my ear, but you know, now I've got a situation where I've got $40,000 mastering speakers and, you know, tube outboard gear and all sorts of digital and everything. So I'm kind of set up to do it in a way. But it, it was a long time before I felt that, 
you know, even a guy I'd already mixed major label records and things like that. I'm like, oh no, man, oh, I'm no. not ready yet. I'm not the ninja. Yeah, <laughs> and those guys are ninjas. Yeah. There, there are a lot of guys who call themselves mastering yeah. engineers now because they bought software yeah. and they've done it a hundred times, but that does not make somebody, you know, Doug Sachs. Yeah, in the old days, you know, we, we sound like a bunch of old men here. Back when we were boys, we are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it used to be when you meet a mastering engineer, it would meet. To me, it was like when you meet somebody and they say, oh, yeah, I'm a fifth degree black belt. It's like, all right. And you're meeting somebody you know has put in the time and done the work and apprenticed and all of that. Right. And now it's sort of like, hey, my mom bought me a laptop for Christmas, so I think I'm a mastering engineer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't want to be elitist. And really, if you do stuff yourself and you love the end results, that's that's the end of the discussion right there. Yeah. Fantastic. But the... What I see from people getting their stuff just butchered by people. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's really, especially these less experienced people don't realize the damage they're doing and how things are not going to translate well. So I'm I'm not elitist about all this, but it's it's heartbreaking to see. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not. But, Ronan is every man. He's not an elitist. But it's just heartbreaking when I see people just get their stuff butchered. And you know what? They may have the software. They may understand the software from mm -hmm. an academic or, um, what's the word, uh, like the physics of yeah, mastering. Uh -huh. But yet they could have monitors that are up against a wall. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sitting on a desk with a bunch of open <laughs> floor space that's booming away. You know, so they didn't exactly. bother to have, you have to have the very first thing you have to have mm -hmm. is a proper listening environment. Yeah. Or all the gear in the world doesn't mean crap. Yeah. And I need to throw in one of my rants. Yeah. If you're going to master, send your stuff out to mastering, send it to a person. Yeah. You don't send it out to this studio or this logo or something like that. Send it to a person. You know, the person who's going to master, you should be able to, you know, talk back and forth about these are the challenges I had mixing. This is the kind of record I want to make. If it comes back in a way that you're not happy with, be able to discuss it. Because, yeah, there's there's a lot of places out there marketing their brand mm -hmm. where they have the actual people or robots yeah. doing the mastering are just not up to snuff. So you're much better with, you know, a small local gal in your neighborhood who, you know, who you trust and know who maybe doesn't have tons of credits than, oh, this place has a famous name and send it off. I just, cause the, yeah, what's going on in some of those places is just borderline criminal. I want to talk about the genesis of the need for mastering, which nobody really thinks about much anymore, but it goes back to the early days when, when you know, masters were cut on lacquer and you, you used a lathe with a cutting head and mastering meant that you, you limited the amount that the, the cutting head would go up and down or how wide the groove would mm -hmm. be because of the physical limitations of the lacquer, yeah. which then translated to the physical limitations of the stampers, which translated to the physical limitations of the vinyl disc itself. Mm -hmm. So originally, it was a safety measure that created uniformity because you mm -hmm. could mix something at one studio, the next song mixed at another studio, and even though everything was 30 ips plus 6 or whatever, the engineers had different levels. So they had to, exactly. so you didn't experience what we experience here at Taxi and you experience mm -hmm. in your studio, is people bring you stuff and the levels are all over the place. So it was a way to get all the levels to be uniform, to not distort, to not create thin groove walls that uh, where you get bleed from one groove wall to the next. Yeah. Um, and then later on, it became an aesthetic thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First, it was mechanical and, yeah. and the physics, and then it became an aesthetic thing because some guys got so good at it, they realized they could add a sheen. Yeah. And now it's only thought of in those terms. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, you know, some of the physical uh, aspects are still there because you're dealing in the digital realm and you're cutting glass masters on CDs. Yeah, and, 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 like and, and a lot of people overlook this, is there's also things in terms of how things are going to uh, transfer into MP3, into AAC, and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that you can do where, oh, yeah, maybe it sounds fine. You're working on your 24-bit master you know, in your own studio, but then when you upload that to CD Baby or any of those places who are then going to, you know, convert that, send it out to TuneCore, like whatever, yeah. aggregate that out in the world, you know, there's things that you can do, especially like up in the top end, which will sound fine until you do that conversion. Mm -hmm. And if you've done the top end in terms of some of the levels, it'll sound beautiful converting 
to MP3. I mean, right. your great master will convert well to MP3 um, if it's done right. But if you kind of get that top end wrong, you can actually go in and really botch it in adding all sorts of distortion and stuff from the conversion that wasn't part of So you've got to be a bit master. of a rocket scientist, fairly intellectual, to understand these things beyond just using your ear and thinking it sounds good. That's one of the reasons I was so scared to do it for so yeah. long. I mean, I'm a guy who could make drums go boom and, you know, <laughs> coach a good performance out of a singer. But when we got into this stuff, it's like it took me years and years before I felt confident that this is something I could, you know, do for other people and not feel guilty. <laughs> I, I remember some of the best mixers back in my day, Criteria in the mid-70s. There was a guy named Don Gaiman uh, and another guy, Alex Sadkin, who sadly uh died in a car crash uh, back in the 70s working on the uh, Simply Red record in the Bahamas. But um, he was a mastering engineer for a good five years before he ever sat behind a console. That was normal. That yeah. was the normal way to come up and, in the old days. And when he did finally sit behind a console, that guy was one hell of a mixer because he could foresee <laughs> where it had to go for mastering yep. before yep. it ever got there. So it, 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 it's not for the faint of heart, and you're not going to learn it in a week or a month or a year. Um, uh, you mentioned CD Baby. I want to bring up something that has nothing to do with the subject of audio today, but do you know I got two emails last night from YouTube saying that they were now taking down, they weren't killing our taxi channel, but they're taking down some of our taxi TV episodes because we play taxi member music on the show. Well, eventually we help these people get publishing deals. And some of the people um, also aggregate their music out through um, CD Baby, which sends it out for microsyncs via Rumblefish. Well, the robots are out there scanning YouTube looking for songs that shouldn't be on yeah. people's channels that didn't pay anything. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so, except that the robot doesn't know anything about fair use mm -hmm. and that it's okay to use music for educational purposes yeah. like we do on Taxi TV. So we're helping people get signed to publishers and the publishers are then reaching out to YouTube and YouTube is killing our shows because of that. And probably when we put the members' music on the show, they weren't signed to anybody. But eventually yeah. we got them signed and <laughs> it came back to bite us on the butt. So I have to now deal with YouTube right after the road rally. <laughs> anyway, just a weird, like, that's something I never could have guessed in a million years. Ah, uh, yes. The next, right. next question is kind of um, about any tips for home mastering, how to get the mix hotter and more present so it sounds polished, please. Uh, I'll just throw in something. Again, this yeah. is something we could just spend a few hours on. <laughs> um, but well, not, it's not like we're going to run out of tape. Exactly. But when you're, when you're mixing um, and get a master later, don't try and make your mix super, super loud. Uh, you know, leave, leave some headroom I'd strongly discourage going in and doing limiting and things like that because mm -hmm. that's going to limit you in terms of some of the options you can do in mastering. So, you know, leave leave a nice 6 dB of headroom in there. You know, don't put limiters on just for loudness and level because that's going to kind of tie up some of your creative options in mixing. There's, you know, uh, again, master, mastering, mastering. Is, mastering is like, again, I was 15 years as a full-time pro before I felt kind of comfortable with this. But, you know, there's things that we can do in terms of like EQ shaping to make things sound louder mm -hmm. uh, without them actually being louder. Because when we really push for super hot levels, you are pushing things into distortion. Mm -hmm. That's just physics. There's not, you know, you know what you're doing is you're reducing dynamics and pushing things into distortion. Laws of physics, anyone who tells you something different is going on, doesn't quite get it. But there are things that we can do in terms of EQ, like certain frequencies we can push up, certain frequencies we can pull out that Let's can make things feel louder. Let's give an example. Um, I've got a piano part playing in a fairly high register doing light little arpeggios, mm -hmm. and I've got a crunchy Gibson playing a distorted guitar part. And I want... Uh, Whenever the piano goes to a mid-register, I tend to lose the guitar. How do you fix that with EQ? Oh, in mastering? No, oh, okay. shoot, we're still on okay. mastering. It's, but uh, what I will say in mixing is pan those things away from each other. Okay. You know, throw one off to one side, the off to the other, just so they can sort of do their thing. In their own space. In their own space. That's going to help a huge amount of your problems. Uh, play around with hard, extreme panning. Uh, 
it's it's really powerful and solves a lot of problems. Right. But also, if you run into a situation where, you know, when that could, piano went down into a lower register and it was starting to mask other instruments, whether mm -hmm. it's guitar or vocal, uh, look at going in and doing kind of dynamic EQ with this. Mm -hmm. So when it goes to the lower register part, look at scooping out mid-range where it might be obscuring other guitars or voices. And, and would you like say that. it's a fair statement to say that uh, low mids between... 400 and 700 are almost always the enemy and sometimes your friend everything is there my voice is there your voice yeah. is there snares kick drums guitars bass mandolins violas everything has a lot of energy in there right and that's why you know mid-range is most of most of mixing is sorting out the mid-range mm -hmm. and that's why you know i think you've got yeah classic yamaha ns10 speakers back here there we go Ugh. why you see so many people still mixing on those i mix on those uh, and there's more hit records mixed on those every day than probably all other speakers combined it's because they really force the mid-range mm -hmm. in your face they force you to deal with it and when you get the mid-range sorted out you know solve these conflicts and problems things just kind of come together and they tend to trans translate really well to multiple systems. Yeah. Um, so yeah. You know, most, most of my mixing, aside from, you know, lots of compression and stuff, is really spent just sorting out, you know, conflicts with subtractive EQ. I'm doing just tons of subtractive EQ where things are like fighting for the same space, deciding who gets to win. You could do an entire course on just subtractive EQ. I could. Because <laughs> everybody wants to just boost you know, upper mids and and high, you know, 8K, I find it, 5 and 8K are very popular frequencies with newbies. And they want the guitar to sound crisper. They want can to almost sing. see the blood coming out of my yeah, ears while I listen right. to your mix. And just <laughs> leave those alone and just roll off 700 on something else so that the natural 8 or 10 or 5K can come through, right? What he's saying is the most important thing of this entire Taxi TV. So... Just remember that part. That's, that's all from, you need And to that's know. from an old guy that does, you know, <laughs> doesn't have Pro Tools at home yeah. or anything. But that's just basic yeah. physics. And understanding the octaves of EQ yeah. by ear training, sweeping equalizers on instruments endlessly is the best ear training you can yeah. do. Yeah, and you know, I, I, I could easily spend a long time. And when I teach courses, I get really in-depth into this because it's so important. But the thing about subtractive EQ, if you see engineers talking about it, like, oh yeah, you should do subtractive EQ. It's not like, well, the proper thing to do is subtractive <laughs> EQ and blah, blah, blah. Use subtractive EQ because it kicks ass. Jeff Emmerich sounds like that when he talks about it, though, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's very proper. He's classier than I am. <laughs> but very proper. it's the thing, subtractive EQ is cool because it kicks ass. Yeah. All of a sudden, it, it makes things better bigger it lets more instruments shine it creates space and there's nothing wrong with additive eq but you know you i discourage you for it from being the basis of people's eq mm -hmm. because the thing is if you get subtractive eq dialed in then when you do get into boosting man is it powerful mm -hmm. you can get in this thing where like 2 db bump in one frequency is like wow yeah like really cool and exciting versus when you're doing all additive they just end up fighting with each other. You know, uh, subtractive EQ is like good neighbors that help each other out, and additive EQ are bad neighbors that fight with each other. Ooh, good analogy. I just I came love, up with that I right now. I love that one. Right, right yeah, now. save that for the course. <laughs> All right. All right, we're in a couple more questions. We're going to start taking questions from you guys, and when we do, just type the word question, colon, and then your question, so it's easy for okay. us to spot it. Oh, this one's easy. It talks about mixing orchestras. Um, no. <laughs> it does. When mixing orchestral hybrid, uh, orchestral, any piece that has a lot of tracks like 14 uh, to 16 or more. I wish that was a lot of tracks. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> with many instruments playing at once, how do you keep the mix from sounding like a big mishmash of sound and still allow every instrument to be heard correctly? Each instrument has a part to play. Uh, you want to hear those parts cleanly, adjusting volume, reverb, etc not a wall of confusion. That's not the mixer's job. I was reading another question, so I oh, okay. pay attention. But so you're basically, on your own there, big buddy. orchestra, yeah, that's not the mixer's job. If, if things are not coming out and competing with each other, that's the arranger's fault. That's the composer's fault mm -hmm. um, or the conductor's fault. So, and if you're doing this in a kind of hybrid virtual instrument kind of thing, um, 
you know, it's your fault. So you want to solve those things at the source. And that's the same with recording a three-piece blues trio, but orchestral where there's so much going on. So mm -hmm. you want to get that stuff right at the source and uh, and then go in and do subtractive EQ. Again, I sound like a broken record here. It's but, true, though. Um, but, you know, look at going in and just finding out where things are masking. You know, what are, you know, what is stomping all over everything. And if you're in a hybrid situation, a lot of times people, you know, oh, I just pulled up my viola sample. So they pull up this nice stereo viola sample. Oh, and then nice cello sample. And then nice, boom, boom, all this stuff. Then wonder why it doesn't sound like an orchestra. Well, orchestra doesn't sound like that. Violins are over here. Basses are over here. Timpani's over here. And they're not all playing the same part. Yeah. And and essentially, like, you know, like a clarinet solo or something is a pretty much a mono event that happens within the context. Mm -hmm. So we end up with this, you know, people pull up, oh, some stereo with all this left-right ambience. So one thing to do is look at, you know, if there are a lot of spot elements, look at reducing those to mono. Yeah. If they're in the chord context and let your big string parts fill up the stereo field, like in terms of your big stereo sound, and then just bring those things in. And also getting into the subtractive EQ, like especially with low frequencies, like, you know, pull low end out of the, the violas to make room for the cello, yeah. pull out low into the cello to make room for the basses. And the same thing would be true of rock records. Yeah. I, I used to roll off bottom end and, you know, on the high end of the piano, you don't, you know, just roll off the bottom end because mm -hmm. you don't want it anyway. Why let the rumble from the low strings bleed into that mic yeah. and just muddy up your mix? Yeah, go listen to a classic Elton John record yeah. and see how, see the complete lack of low end yeah. on those. You're like, gank, 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 gank. And man, those records sound great. And the bass and the kick on those records sounded amazing because it wasn't fighting with the bottom end of the piano yeah. rolling around in a fishbowl. Yeah, right? exactly correct. Wow. <laughs> It's amazing how just the most basic laws of the the laws of physics as they apply to sound haven't changed, even though the gear yeah. and the venues and everything else has. <laughs> yep. All right. Uh, let's take a question. Side chain everything. Huh? But, uh... I wish there was a TV audio engineering game show. <laughs> that's a great idea name that frequency uh, yeah, exactly <laughs> name how many milliseconds are on that delay it'd be after a month though i think we. so what question do we set the high pass filter on again high pass filter is the fancy name for that thing that cuts off the low end um as much as we can get away with and that's yeah. um and that that is actually realistic so you want to hear uh you know as much as you can get away with the the more low end you can cut off the more you're piano is going to pop out of the mix. Listen to like Sarah Bareilles's, you know, love song. Mm -hmm. Man, that piano is just like high end, just bang, bang, bang. It's no low end in that at all. Right. Um, so as much as you can get away with it, but a really important thing is to uh, don't worry about what that sounds like soloed. Mm -hmm. Worry about what that sounds like with your bass. Because one thing is if we cut off a lot of low end from the piano and then put a bass, especially a bass that's playing kind of longer sustained notes, mm -hmm. when we drop in that bass, it will sound like the piano has more low frequencies. It'll feel like there's an ex extra octave in there. So do it in context. Yeah. And it's okay to hunt around for a bit. I mean, I'd like to sometimes in solo, so I get an idea of what's happening, but always make that final decision in context. But to, but to put a number on it, that could be anywhere from 100 hertz on something like a ballad to all the way up to like 600 hertz or something in a real forward kind of pop mix. And it also greatly depends on the on the key you're in. Yep. And, you know, the octave, the player, you know, you could be in the key of G, but somebody's capo and, you know, just mm -hmm. a, a million factors. But it takes ear training. Yep. Uh, none of this stuff is formulaic. It, it requires you to sit there and experiment. But you guys have the luxury of the home studio to yes. do that with. Yeah. So somebody's asking 44.1 versus 48K. Um, the long story is 48K was actually designed literally to make your life hell. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was. It was originally created to be incompatible with professional audio, but somehow got picked up as a standard for television and film. Uh, so really work to your market. Um, most of your work, you're doing a lot of music for film and television. A lot of that tends to be 48. Mm -hmm. um, I still do most of my records at 44.1. Um, you know, maybe in several years I might move up to one of the higher sample rates, but not yet. 
Uh, not not for tracking, anyway. Nobody who's working on reality TV gives a damn. <laughs> uh, and, and probably 80% of all the music that our members get placed ends up in reality TV. And sadly, a lot of it, uh, if it's not reality TV, it, it's source music coming out of a... Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a jukebox forty feet away in a bar with dialogue that's right up here. Yeah, it just doesn't matter. Yeah, but uh, I mean, not not to say you should have crappy sounding audio, but you got to think of the context. Well, of the, the one thing is, you know, the difference between forty four one and forty eight one being significantly better is just it's just not real world. Yeah. So I think the important thing is who are you collaborating with, who are your clients. Things like that, and more, and just pick one and stick with it, because bouncing around is where the headaches start. Yeah, really. So find one, um, stick with it. The thing is, sample rate conversion has gotten way better than it used to be. So it doesn't do the damage that it did, even just ten years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so do that, and yeah, and you'll be fine. The one thing is, I've got a buddy who's who mixes for like gigantic major like pop and R and B stuff. He likes to work at 48 because they do so much time manipulation, like mm -hmm. slowing things down for to put them as loops and other things. And he he feels that 48 time stretch is better than 40, hmm. 44 one Because and, there's more information. Yeah. And he mixed the biggest selling download of all time. So uh, what so, was it? I got a feeling. Uh, oh, wait. Uh oh, they're going to take you off YouTube for me singing that. Sorry. No. Uh, that was, that <laughs> I technically know, I was not even singing. Okay. Hey, hey. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but the one thing I will say, like, in terms of, like, the higher sample rates, and that wasn't your question, is I've got nothing against them, but they double your hard drive space. They double your uh, DSP load on your things. And I would say of my friends who are working on major films, like big Hollywood films, and rock records and stuff, almost all of them are still at 44.1 or 48. Question, once you have a solid recording of your acoustic guitar in the mix, what are some EQ and compression techniques to make the acoustic guitar sound more professional, including eliminating the hiss? Notching specific frequencies in and out, low filters. Hmm, hiss, we shouldn't hey, be getting that. How, yeah, how do you get hiss nowadays? It could, it could be just a lot of cheaper mic preamps when you push them really hard. Induce a lot of hiss. What are you using, Robbie? Yeah, because I mean, if you're gain staging well, uh -huh. you know, if your preamp is somewhere up around one or two or three o'clock, and um, your, your input fader is somewhere around zero, and your compressor is somewhere around unity gain, you've gain staged. I mean, you can hardly screw it up with that. Yeah. You shouldn't be getting hiss from the electronics. Yeah. So, somewhere in there, you're introducing it. But with that one little thing, Isotope RX. Is I don't know. so no. awesome. What is it for noise reduction? I'm, you know, it's know. just staggeringly how good it is. And um, I wish they gave me money for recommending it, but they don't. Um, but just for cleaning up hiss and things, it's one of my favorite pieces of software. Yeah. Because if I have a great recording that's got hiss, it eliminates it so well. If I've got, you know, doing a guitar recording, we're like, man, I really want that Strat through that old vintage fuzz pedal. Yeah. Gzz, it's amazingly good at cleaning that stuff up. And, and it comes out the other end sounding like it did going in just without the hiss. It's that true? Extremely close. Wow. Extremely close. I even use it sometimes like in mastering if I'm restoring old things from analog tape and things like that. So it's um, it's remarkably good. And I think today, actually, their mailing list, it's the last day of their special for their new version, which I'm not upgrading to the new version. But <laughs> um, yeah, Isotope RX is just amazing for that. There's some other things that are doing it too, but... For something that's like two hundred bucks, it's 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 saved so much stuff for me over the years, and especially for me, I love like doing crazy stuff. I love I record outdoors a lot and mm -hmm. all sorts of crazy things. Like I was just um, my last tracking date was I was recording um, filmmaker Robert Rodriguez's little sister playing castanets in a parking garage in Texas. That's what I was doing two or three days ago. <laughs> wow. And, you know, and I love kind of doing these fun, just remote locations, getting interesting people and putting them into fun places. And things like Isotope RX, I can go in and, you know, get rid of like air conditioner noises or even a lot of times truck rumbles that go by. Let's talk like about that. that because that that's something that plagues these guys. I don't want to spend 10 minutes on it, but... People think they need these acoustically perfect studios that they've got, you know, okay, I've got an extra, I've got a basement studio. And they go to these very expensive extremes to build out these great sounding rooms. And I contend that 
75 percent of them probably sound worse after they're done than they did before they started what are some just basic rules of thumb for somebody that's got a laptop a thousand dollars worth of in the box stuff mm -hmm. and a 200 hundred dollar microphone a reasonably good mic pre and a pair of ns10s or some other reasonably good mid price monitors what are some rules of thumb about how to set that gear up do you isolate the monitors with you know some foam from the surface they're sitting on do you do them horizontally versus vertically um, how close or how far from the wall do you put them do you put a base trap under the table things like that so we get how many weeks do we have to do this show um, <laughs> but you know but the uh, I know. The, the first thing is don't take up valuable real estate putting in a vocal booth. They're just dumb. Nobody needs a vocal booth. But so. people would contend, oh, yeah, but you're going to hear the fan on my laptop, or you're going to hear my wife's, the dishwasher upstairs. The dishwasher's not running 24 7, unless right. you're above a restaurant or <laughs> something. Um, but uh, yeah, because they just eat up space, they make the room sound worse. Mm -hmm. Orientation of the speakers depends on the manufacturer. Some and but the great thing is just try both. You know, okay. even if they tell you to do it this way, you can try both. It's not going to blow up your house. Or... And always check the phase. Yeah. If you don't hear anything coming out of the center, definitively coming out of the center, yeah. you've got a wire reverse. Yeah. And yeah, and hit your mono button. That'll really help. If you, you have a mono. If you have a mono button. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like one of the things you can do is actually in terms of raising them off. There's a, a company called ISO Acoustics mm -hmm. um, for like a hundred bucks. They make these stands that, you know, I did a bunch of testing and they really significant improvements. Not 100%. I tested a lot of different things. Yeah. And there was one where like, eh, no, I, actually, even one setup, I didn't like them. Mm -hmm. But where they did work, they were just ridiculously big improvements. And, and that's something almost everybody should have. People will take speakers uh, and, and put them right on a Formica top desk. Yeah. And first of all, they're probably too low. Second of all, the desk is going to resonate like the top of an acoustic <laughs> exactly. guitar. And you've got a bunch of false information. Yeah. But yeah, the isoacoustic ones. There's other companies that make them, but I tested a bunch, and those were my favorite. Hmm. And, hundred bucks. And they're a hundred bucks, yeah. And yeah. I even have, again, my giant $40,000 mastering speakers are 300 pounds each. Wow. Uh, I was kind of so impressed with what they did with my smaller speakers that I had them custom build me some for my big speakers. Yeah. Um, so they're pretty rocking, but also just treating the room in terms of looking at things, uh, acoustic treatments based on, you know, mineral wool or high density fiberglass. What about the out of the box dish? prefab things, you know, like the, um, the, the things that look like a city skyline, I can't, uh, uh, something diffu diffusers. Diffusers. Really for, for diffusers to work, you need a pretty large space. Diffusers actually don't work that well in smaller environments. Okay. Really absorption is the things that's going to be the biggest bang for the buck. Mm -hmm. And um, like if you if you have some, you can make them yourself. You can learn how to do these. And there's a few company, LA Sound Panels, the guys I use here in LA, but um, there's uh, Ready Traps in Connecticut and GIK Acoustics in Atlanta. What about uh, the tube traps? Those have been around forever and seem to be They're really popular. cool, but they're also really expensive. Yeah. So my, yeah, the only negative thing about those is, you know, hope you got some room on your credit card and for those. And corners are your enemy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. If, if, you're, if you're looking to dial in a room and uh, do some research on Super Chunk for, for bass traps. Look up Super Google Super Chunk bass traps. It is a really powerful, efficient way to get a lot of uh, bang for your buck without taking up a lot of space in the corners. Is this stuff cheap enough? That, I mean, you can go build yourself a, a, a corner bass trap. Yeah. But, you know, if you have any carpentry skills at all. Any. Pretty darn. Any. Yeah. I, I have none. But somebody with any can yeah. can, can do it. I mean, and what, all you need a, a, is a chop saw, um, yeah. a good screwdriver, and some glue, and, and some Owens Corning seven hundred three. Yeah, stack and, it up floor to ceiling. Yeah, and you could build out the whole thing in parts for each corner for under a hundred dollars. I agree, and that would's going to work way better than almost any of the other fancy stuff that somebody could sell you at the guitar store. Um. Uh, Two uh, Getting into the ratios and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mojo Bone's very smart. <laughs> Let's see. 
Question, what process would you recommend to get a decent MP3 from a 48K 24-bit master? Um, basically just have it converted. I mean, the conversion programs are good. iTunes actually does pretty decent conversion. So you could pull your pull your high-res master into iTunes and export it. I mean, I, I do it straight out of Pro Tools. And, you know, we have some higher-end mastering things. But really, you shouldn't have to do any processing except the conversion. Um, yeah, on that. So get it sounding right. And we talked a little bit earlier about the stuff you can do to create problems. Um, having your stuff right up to zero is the most problematic thing you can do for conversion to MP3 or AAC or any other compressed format, because there's um, inner sampling peaks that things you don't even that don't exist when you just do your master at high resolution in your DAW. But when you do the conversion, uh, the conversion program gets a little freaked out and starts to introduce distortion. So um, the the newer standards that people are moving to is leaving a bit of headroom there. You know, some even like up to half a dB or so at least. Um, uh, where'd it go? Somebody, Wadi JP, oh. after you've completed your mix, what are the pros and cons of putting a plug-in like Ozone on the main bus and doing the mastering of the bounce right there? Ah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, by the way, Bluesman, uh, non-FRK or non-FSK <laughs> when you're getting your Owens Corning 703, uh, for building super chunk traps. So, um... <laughs> Uh, I recommend don't do it. That's no comment on ozone mm -hmm. uh, to that. It's I I really encourage people to not try to master while they're mixing. You can't. Mm -hmm. You're just mixing with aggressive processing on your stereo bus. And I think it's a really, really good idea to finish a mix, export the mix at full resolution without a bunch of monkey business on the stereo bus. And then, you know, take the dog for a walk, whatever, take a break, come back put on your mastering engineer hat, create a new session, and import that file directly in, and just be in mastering mode. Is it possible to do that? Because that's the beauty, I believe, of a mastering engineer, is you spend all this time on the minutia of a mix, and you can no longer have any objectivity. A mastering engineer hears it completely different than you or I would. Yeah. So is it humanly possible for the guy who recorded it and mixed it to take the dog for a walk, come back in, and, and put on the mastering hat and be objective? I mean... In, in a perfect world, no. But it's also the reality of the world we live in. I right. mean, especially like a lot of taxi members who are, great, we have a great opportunity for a listing. Mm -hmm. We need a X, Y kind of thing. And they're, wah, writing away and mixing away. And, oh, God, deadline. I just, right. I just, time I just saw that, that tweet. <laughs> Yeah. And so the reality is we, we have to do that in a way many times. Even if you're in a big time crunch, it doesn't take a lot of extra time. You know, there's no taxi deadline that, you know, taking a 10-minute break mm -hmm. <laughs> to take a breather is, and to export something and import it back is going to kill you. And so I think it's a really good idea. And, you know, one of the ways I, I deal with this dilemma because I actually am in a situation where I mix and master um, both which traditionally isn't your perfect perspective, but in real world, it actually works out quite well for a lot of clients. But you've trained yourself over a very long period. To do and that. my room is completely modular. So actually, when I'm, when I'm a mixing engineer, um, my, my entire mix position moves. My like, control surf, surface screen, everything moves. Mm -hmm. And I have one position where I mix in one part of the room and work on one set of speakers, Yamaha NS10s, uh, and when I trade off to that mastering engineer hat, I'm actually moving to a completely different place in the room, listening on completely different speakers and things like that. So I do get the advantage of the, a very different environment with a different set of anomalies and things like that to at least try and add that. Are you able to replicate it like dead nuts on every time just because you've already measured the distances when you find... Oh, you it's know, a piece the, of tape on the floor. Okay, we, good. I mean, so, and those, those positions we've actually... Um, actually mapped out with frequency analysis tools. Mm -hmm. So they're actually, okay, this is exactly the spot where the dip at 80 hertz, <laughs> you know, right. get 6 dB better, things like that. So we, we've even mapped it out to what door should be open or closed wow. in the back of the control room. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah, nerdy stuff, but it makes a difference.
What speakers do you use to master? Ah, they <laughs> and how expensive are they again? Yeah, they're about forty thousand bucks. But um, but <laughs> there's they, your answer right there. Yeah, you they're probably aren't going to buy them. Yeah, you probably aren't because these are actually one of a kind. There's a a small company from Belgium called Far Active. Uh, so they're they're three ways. They have thousand watt drivers just for the low frequent power amps, just for the low frequency drivers, ribbon tweeters, the whole works. But uh, so yeah, you won't buy those. And uh, actually, if you go to Recording Boot Camp and kind of look through, actually, no, it's on YouTube. Um, yeah, if you go and uh, just go to my YouTube, search for Ronan Chris Murphy on YouTube, I did a whole video about the modular setup, which uh, which uh, has worked out pretty well. Go to Logic, da, da, da. Come on, questions, where right. are you? So, yeah, but while he's looking for that, um, I wish there was an easy link. Uh, I'm giving away a free mic, which people love free stuff. Yes, they do. Uh, Roswell Pro Audio, the Mini K47. And uh, it's kind of... You're giving it away today on the show or at the road rally? Well, I'm giving it away, um, not at the show, but it's I'm doing the giveaway. Uh, I pull the prize on the day after the road rally. Okay. So you can sign up there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, But yeah, it's uh, just on my website. People can sign up. Got it. And um, it's like I'll a $300 mic. And tell them what your website is. So... Uh, it, go to recordingbootcamp.com, and uh, I actually don't have the giveaway on the front page, but there's an extra stuff and then giveaways. So go to the extra stuff menu and then look for giveaways and just um, sign up, and you can win the mic. And then the next month I actually have like an $800 software package I'm giving away. So a bunch of cool companies have sort of given me free stuff to give away to people. Which is I, every year they give me free stuff to give away at the road rally, and I take it all home. Yeah, woo! <laughs> no, I don't. Actually, in all these years, I think I've taken one. And of course, at the road rally, we always do giveaways too. So, actually, what we're going to do is, um, if anyone's interested in mastering, we all, we, we're giving away a four-song um, mastering package. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm about to launch the big online component. People have been begging me to do it for like a decade, and finally, it's been a lot of work yeah. to take a lot of what I do. And we're starting to launch on online courses. So we're also going to give away like a $300 credit to wow. somebody at the road rally. Free uh, stuff. Woohoo. Uh, when did Dither? Um, Dither is something you don't need to worry too much about. Um, and Dither was like a 1988 problem, wasn't it? Well, it's still a, a problem with in very specific things. You yeah. still sort of have to do it. It's basically a thing to get more resolution when you're... Um, to make it feel like you have more resolution when you go from a higher bit depth to a lower bit depth. Right. Um, most of the time in rock and pop, you wouldn't really notice the difference. But when you're sort of figuring out when to use it, my, the safest thing is just don't do any of it until the very last stage. When you're ready to go down to... You know, like 24-bit recording or 32-bit float, when you're ready to go down to your 16-bit master for CD, that would be the time to do it. I remember orchestral guys um, doing, you know, like a, a violin soloist in a concert hall would be very concerned. Those are the people who would notice dither. Right. Anybody working on a rock, rock or a pop record. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's too much. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I mean... We've got a range of people on here yep. that, you know, but for the average guy with a home studio, dither should probably not even be in your vocabulary. Yeah. Kind of my yeah. guess. And somebody asked if I should use a set, uh, should use a separate Pro Tools or whatever DAW you're using session for mastering. I strongly recommend it. Just uh, there's some workflow issues. You can dedicate all your processing power just to that stereo track. Um, and it also, if you're working on a collection of songs, it makes it a lot easier to compare song to song for consistency. And also, it's a lot easier to compare out to different references. So especially in Taxi World, if you have a listing looking for something in the style of like a replacement for film placement, you can actually pull in the original master and then even master yours to even get kind of the tonal balance of the song that needs to get replaced. Uh, before this scrolls off the screen, uh, Charles Wilson says, I sometimes have issues with my bass being too loud against the rest of the mix, just getting it right in the right space. Any tips for mixing bass against the rest of the mix to get it just right? Yeah, that's a lifelong one. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing is compression. I keep saying that. But a lot of times, you know, compressing a bass um, not even dramatically, sometimes dramatically, but that'll keep it in check um, a little bit. 
And a big thing too is like looking at the other elements in the mix and like carving out low end from the other elements uh, just so you can actually bring the mix lower into the mix and still hear it. Because it's kind of amazing. Like if you go and like cut low end off the guitars and keyboards, it's amazing how much bass presence comes out. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's one of the things I demonstrate in my courses. I'll show people and I'll sound like a bass player just kind of going boom, 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 boom. Then you cut the low end off like the guitars and the keyboards. All of a sudden you realize it's going boom, 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 boom. You know, because you really can't have a lot of things competing in the low end. Yeah. I mean, you can like stoner rock and things like that. Some specific genres that are really into just mud low end. Yeah. That's a thing. But for, for most styles of music, you really can't have more than one or two things in a we mix with always, any low end. We always end up back here because it's one of these key things. It, it is. It's the arrangement. Yeah. And something that we've never talked about on any of the shows uh, is... A lot of these guys' bass isn't their main instrument, mm -hmm. but they can play bass decently enough yep. to get by in their stuff. So they go out and they buy a P bass for 300 bucks at an antique shop or yep. a swap meet or something. Damn. And, uh, I wish I was at that swap meet. But. Well, you know, so, you know, I actually <laughs> yeah. saw a really nice one, a swap meet not mm -hmm. long ago. It was a few hundred bucks. I was kind of amazed. Mm -hmm. um, and the neck looked good on it. Yeah. You know, I couldn't plug it into anything. But my point is, they put a set of strings on it, and that's the only set of strings it ever gets. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then maybe they keep the strings they bought it with on there. And just like acoustic guitar strings, bass strings suck with age. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They they get they oxidize. Yep. And I have found that putting new bass strings on a P bass and not using it the first day because they won't stay in tune very well. But you know, keep stretching them, exercise yeah. them, and a week later, you will get the most amazing sound out of the bass. Because yeah, especially got, for real modern styles where yeah, the right. bass is yeah. crisp and clear versus just yeah. sit real sitting tubby underneath. Uh, it, it just makes a world of difference. Yeah. And we're also talking before the show. You know, if, if you're taking a Hofner bass and trying to make it sound like a P bass on on, uh, on a pop record. It's not going to mm -hmm. work. Yeah, and Hoffner's that old Beatles bass that you always saw. Right, the violin jump, bass. Which tends to go boom, 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 boom. Yeah. It doesn't have sustain, but it's got great fat tone. It's, it's um, thumpy. Yeah, one thing to do um, is uh, also, too, is a lot of times there's a lot of low frequencies in electric bass that are big and prominent, but not that exciting, kind of in the range of around 125 hertz. So a lot of times I'll take sort of a, just a parametric EQ and start around 125, maybe just pulling down like 3 dB, and scoop around and listen. Because a lot of times there's a just a fat tubbiness, like woof, 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 in the bass that's not very exciting. And when you pull that out, all of a sudden the bass gets exciting, more articulate and powerful, mm -hmm. but doesn't eat up the rest of the mix as well. I, I've got to say, I uh, Kenny Kerner passed away two years ago, maybe. Um, and he used to do all of our passenger profiles for the newsletter. So I took over the job of doing the passenger profiles. One of the questions I always ask our members, and these are generally pretty successful members, not like, you know, mega millionaires, but they're guys that are doing it, making yeah. 10 to 50 grand a year, mostly film and TV stuff. And I always ask them, tell me about your home studio. And the answer is, invariably the same i'm almost embarrassed to tell you because i have very little mm -hmm. i have a keyboard i have a limited amount of, of um sample libraries very very basic stuff yeah <laughs> and i'm just fearful that when we talk about this stuff people are running out and buying a new preamp they're buying a new this buying a new that it, it's a lot of it has to do with the ear i want to go back to a question russell landwehr asked a, a minute ago um how do you place a stereo synth track in a mix depends on the role it's playing um if it's if it's a stereo synth track that's designed to sort of fill up the space like a pad might be you know i'll usually sort of pan it out and usually do some subtractive eq to mm -hmm. get in its place if it's something like a you know something like a that might play a riff da, 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 i'll i'll usually actually reduce that to mono i'll mm -hmm. see if i can throw away one side I'm trying to make as many things in my mix mono as possible. And let them play off each other. I'm guessing yeah. if you've got that da, 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 on the synth that you're hoping maybe you've got a chicken-picking guitar <laughs> part that's talking to it yeah. from the other side. 
Yeah, and, and mostly I kind of want my elements to be more discreet because really lots of stereo elements make for really sort of wobbly mono mixes. Oh, and then you add reverb. Yeah, exactly. And, and everybody tries to add individualized reverb for, you know, like I'm going to use something with a, a four-second decay on this, and I you know and then uh, a one-second plate on that, and then a delay on that, and you end up with, I don't care how good you are yeah. at arranging and mixing, when you add all that reverb, what you get is a giant abyss it's yeah. a wash yeah which again if you're doing film score background music that's one thing yep but uh yeah somebody asked how my golf game was and and that's an allusion to i think it's may i'm doing this thing called the mountain recording retreat yeah so out in west virginia just like uh 90 minutes from dulles Air washington dulles airport so it's like five days in the mountains at this resort and uh, just a bunch, bunch of recording people getting together, kind of workshops and panels, all inclusive, and uh, yeah, all inclusive with you know, go par three golf, all you can eat food, lodging. When is this? May sixteenth. May six, middle of May. I have to look at recording. Uh, Recordingretreat dot com. I only get to golf once a year. When Ralph Murphy comes to town um, every April, I believe, he stays at my house, and he and I go out for either two or three days and play golf. I love you. Um, you should come and be a mentor. That would be I, so awesome. I, I would love to do that, you know, because I could probably talk about stuff that other guys, you know, let them talk yeah. about audio, and I can talk about what you do with your audio when you're yeah. done with it. But I would love to play golf with a bunch of uh fellow engineers. You should come out. Yeah. And by the way, we're uh, you can go to recording retreat, recordingretreat.com. Yeah. But we're going to do a $500 off to people if people come to the Taxi Road Rally and sign wow. up, we're going to do a $500 off, nice. which which makes like the lowest price things would be like just over 900 bucks for um, all inclusive for 5 days. Tell you what, I'm going to give everybody $500 off on the road rally this year. Just saying. <laughs> you give them cash back at the end of it? Oh, we have people that call up and say, if the road rally is free, why aren't you paying for my hotel and airfare? <laughs> I kid you not. Every year we get those calls. Uh, and new staff members are always stunned by that. It's quite funny, actually. Um, no, Jesse Peck, don't give up on Quadraphonic. Just keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Ronan, do you EQ before compression or after? Great question with a simple answer. Um, oh, by the way, my golf game is terrible. It's always been terrible, but that doesn't stop me from enjoying it. That's another reason you and oh. I should hang out. <laughs> exactly. But um, as a general rule, there's exceptions and different techniques. As a general rule, subtractive EQ before compression, uh, additive EQ after. So it's, it's, you know, there, there are other techniques that you can do, but as a general rule, uh, cut before compression, boost after, because... Um, you know, you're, you're getting rid of frequencies that the compressor doesn't have to deal with because they're not going to be in the final mix. And actually, compression can kind of undo some of your boosts. So as a general rule, cut before, boost after. I'm looking for another question. I'm not ignoring you. But <laughs> yeah, I'm, that's fine. I'm scanning for questions here. Love Dark Side of the Moon. We decided to see David Gilmore instead of the road rally. We understand. Oh, we miss you. I once took what? What was the movie like? Seven or eight years ago, they had a live to theater broadcast of uh, was it Gilmore? I don't know. I, I just remember I took mm -hmm. the whole staff out to nice. see this thing. We all went out to dinner, and uh, I remember a lot of the staff members. I think might have smoked marijuana before they went to this thing and people <laughs> fell asleep in their seats it's like dude i went to great lengths and a lot of money to take you guys out to dinner and go to pasadena to see this and now you're yeah. all sleeping through it yeah so uh <laughs> drug addicts <laughs> yeah but by the way like come see me at the road rally because uh we're gonna be in the booksellers room and i'm doing oh, i think i'm doing one-on-one -on -one men I might be doing one-on-one -on -one mentoring. <laughs> Mojo says, money. I've seen him road rallies better. Sorry. I couldn't oh, oh, nice. <laughs> Thanks, Mojo. <laughs> but uh, Sunday at 9 a.m., Angel's got me on early, but we're in the theater. Okay. And, uh, and schedule-wise, I'm right up against something from Fett, who is awesome, but he's doing the same course a couple days earlier. So go see Fett. <laughs> do his thing on the first one, and then come see me. We try to do that. You know, um, I... It, Scheduling the road rally is 
especially the well scheduling Herculean. It, it is it's not just a hundred people it's a hundred people like on a four level yes, chessboard in the exactly. piece, and the pieces are frogs and turtles mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's amazing we try not to make things collide yeah. and then there are other things like we've got to consider are you doing a class then going to mentor launch and then going to do a panel mm -hmm. where your throat's going to be like this so i've got to hand it to angel nobody will ever 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 in the history of the <laughs> world understand how difficult her job is and i know she hates public recognition but <laughs> i so badly want to get her like a six foot high oscar and give it to her on stage at the road rally but she would kill me she would really hurt me if i did that <laughs> but you guys all need to know that not only does she have to deal with one-to-one -one mentors um scheduling the classes scheduling people for mentor lunches, but then she has to look at it against my ballroom schedule mm -hmm. and people's travel schedules and people just, it's, it's a nightmare, <laughs> but she pulls it off. But it ends up being awesome. But yeah, so Sunday morning, and I'm doing this thing on removing the bar barriers to broadcast quality, where I'm basically going to show you that your, your gear, your studio setup, isn't the thing keeping you from mm -hmm. making hit records and broadcast quality masters. Robbie Hansock Cox says, give her uh, an Oscar anyway. No, she would hurt me. She'd beat me with it. She hates public recognition. She hates when we bring up the all the staff members at the end to take a bow. It's like, I could see it in Angel's eyes. Lasco, why are you making me do this? So, Ronan, you forgot to do Turbo Monday. It is still Monday, and I might have a special guest. Oh, this that's Monday. right. Hmm. He, he might. So, yeah. Go to just hunt for Ronan Chris Murphy on YouTube. And every Monday I do like five minutes of answering questions about recording for people. Would you consider recording the rally again with prepaid member purchases? Um, I don't know. I'd have I to hope think you about don't. It. Yeah. Because what know. I love is getting all the people together. I know. That that's the the spirit of the rally is the is that people come from all over the world. It, it's a community. Yeah. All I did was open up the doors to the barn, but you guys are the community and made it so special. Ask anybody who's ever been to any other conference of this size, and they will tell you that the road rally blows them all away for community and the yeah. vibe. And the networking is, is just off the charts. Um, yeah, I, I've told these guys before. I've recorded the whole thing, edited the whole thing down, because I had hundreds of people say, I want to buy it, I want to buy it. We priced it like stupidly inexpensive. And I think it was either six or 12 people bought it. And I wanted to put a gun in my mouth. It's like, <laughs> why did I spend 60 hours editing this? Uh, question, how do I keep side vocals from muddying up my main vocals, especially if I'm singing all of them? Hmm, that's a great question. Subtractive EQ. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, um, subtractive EQ. And, I, and I'm assuming by side that you just mean like doing additional harmony vocals and things like that. Um, subtractive EQ is a good way, again, just get frequencies that are really important to the main vocal out of the backup vocals. Um, also, it's a really good idea to switch even to a different microphone. I'm just writing down. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. so move to a different microphone, move, move a foot back or closer just to make it a little bit different because, mm -hmm. and this is the case with all mixing, when you just keep piling more and more of the same stuff over and over on something, it doesn't get bigger and cooler. It actually starts to get smaller and less interesting. So yeah, look at using different mics, different mic position, and different place, EQ. different place in the room, mm -hmm. um, different compression. Any variables that you can change yep. will make it sound yeah less like it's yeah. the same person. Yeah. Sing yeah. a little breathier and things like that. So hope that helps. Um, Jim Carvalho, Michael, can we get a room for our G G Oz thing? Um, it's really big this year. <sighs> I'm guessing not. You would not believe. Seriously, what we go through to get the spaces we get at the hotel, because, of course, they would love to take every empty space and rent it out for a wedding at night or some corporate meeting or whatever. It, 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 it is a Herculean task to get everything that we get. So all I can say is, yeah, you guys could you know, find an open room and go in there and take the chance that you're going to get kicked out. Um, do not go into the ballroom. Promise me at night you will not go into the grand ballroom because seriously, um, the, the audio guys would kill me because mm -hmm. they like to leave stuff set up and we've had people go in there and play with the mixer 
at night. And then the next morning they walked in right before we did some big panel in the mixer was, I wanted to say the F word, but screwed up. <laughs> um, so do not go into the grand ballroom. But if you want to go up on the second floor somewhere, go. you know what? Go into one of the jam rooms. Um, we do set up rooms where you guys can go in and jam. Just go there. Um, Man, somebody just teed that up for me. What is your fee structure for evaluating mixes? Then moving forward, um, go to recordingbootcamp.com. There's stuff on there. There's there's the stock rates that you'll see listed, but you've got something more complex. Contact me about that. But somebody else just asked, you know, I record in a lot of different places. I've, you know, recorded in, you know, the canals of Venice and uh, recorded <laughs> the Alamo last week and outside, not inside, couldn't get inside. But the person asked, and the name's already gone past, but do I do it just for sound or for performance? The answer is for both, but more importantly, it's the performance. Mm -hmm. I do it because, you know, the adventure of running around into non-traditional things I think it sort of excites the creative process that's different. And I mm -hmm. love studios. You know, I've dedicated my whole life to hanging out in them and making records. But these days I'm so excited about getting out of them, you know, going into interesting places, people's houses, outdoors. I do lots of outdoor recording these days Yeah, because it's just trying to get that creative spark because it's it seems harder for people to get and be creative these days. I don't know why that is, but, you know, and when, and when you sort of take people out of these sort of traditional settings, you know, I kind of find their creative mind opens up a little bit. Performances are more exciting. So I did this um, record for a great band called Ria Fiora in Italy a few years ago. And, um, you know, we recorded drums and bass in a traditional studio, but everything else was remote. remote. Mm -hmm. You know, in palazzos, recorded, we recorded some of the lead vocals in the middle of St. Mark's Square <laughs> in Venice at like one in the morning. And I had actually didn't need a reverb plug in for that. No, it sounded beautiful. <laughs> and um, but I'd actually recorded like one or two of the songs in the studio with great mic pre's and everything. And and these other things, we used a handheld Zoom H4N recorder right. with the onboard microphones. Yeah. Yeah. Using onboard microphones. And that ended up being the masters. Because, yes, the studio was sonically better, you know, less noise, richer mid-range, all those kind of geeky things we care about. But when you just A-B back and forth, the performance was so much more exciting. It wins every time. I'm, there. The two gems. I'm the guest, and the two awesome gems of the whole thing come from you. Come well, on. And, Thanks. And I got to tell show you. Show me up. Thanks, I, I wasn't doing that to show you <laughs> up. It's just, you know who taught me that? Neil Young. Yeah. Neil Young said to me, it's the performance. You know, don't worry about it. The audio just doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah. Um, and I will say, uh, supporting what you just said, that uh, the song Look Out For My Love might have been recorded in a room at Neil's house with the fireplace crackling in the background mm -hmm. on a realistic mono cassette deck. Yeah. Might have been, because yeah. I, I know a guy. And, yeah. and made it to the record that way. If yeah. you listen carefully, you will hear snap, crackle, pop from yeah. the logs. Yeah, and I can't go so far as to say that the sound doesn't matter to me, because I love great audio. Yeah. I love beautiful sounding records. But all of that stuff is in support of a great performance. Yep. Nobody cares about a pristine recording of a mediocre performance. And if the performance is amazing, right. nobody cares what it sounds like. And you then know? you have Steely Dan song, Asia, which I, mm -hmm. I've i always said is the best recorded, best performed, best mixed, best mastered, everything all in one place. Mm -hmm. Just sit down and listen to Steely Dan, Asia on a That's pair of great- That's AJA if you're, young, yeah. if you're a young little kid. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know what's state of the art, it still holds up today, but the performance will, it brings tears to my eyes. Mm -hmm. It's like going into the Louvre and looking at a painting <laughs> and, and it reduces you to tears. You don't know why. That's what Asia is for me because everybody performed their art so perfectly. Love that. Uh, question, do you do a lot of parallel compression, especially on lead vocals in bass and mastering? Any tips on that technique? Luke. I don't do any of it in mastering. Um, and I do a bit of it sometimes, but I almost, I don't do it that often on vocals. I know a lot of great mixers do. I just kind of like the control. Most of the time I'm really just working with one vocal track and trying to get that right. Some other mixers who do work, I love do it differently. And um, and actually, even bass most of the time. Honestly, where I 
get into parallel compression if I'm going to do it is in dr in drums. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the one place where in my own personal workflow where I find that to be a really, really powerful tool. Here's something nobody's ever asked you. Do you prefer a drum kit with um, two rack mounted toms and a floor? Do you go for three toms or two toms? Do you, any preference? It's the drummer's performance. What does the drummer need? Um, for the most part, I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to go for the smallest amount of toms possible. Mm -hmm. This sounds kind of funny from a guy who's worked with Terry Bozio <laughs> several times, but <laughs> but um, but uh, traditionally, for the most part, for like punchy pop and rock kind of things. One of the things people don't realize is toms have a lot of sympathetic resonance Tons. in a way, and uh, and especially if you haven't treated that well. So with a, if too much of that is going on, it's going to really rob the drums of presence and articulation. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a kind of thing where, you know, especially a drummer comes in with like two floor toms, mm -hmm. you know, we'll actually have the conversation like, how many songs do you use this on? Right. And a lot of times it's like, oh yeah, that one ballad, I hit it in the bridge. And, it's like, and, okay. For and, they <laughs> and they offer to throw a towel over it. Like, yeah. that's really going to solve the problem. Yeah. So <laughs> you turn it upside down and throw a towel on it. That way. But, <laughs> but then they're like, great, let's get rid of it for nine songs and pull it back for the ballad. Yeah. Um, there are a few situations where that sympathetic resonance can be really cool. Actually, I mean, Terry Bozio is mind boggling. You sit in his drum stool and talk, and it sounds like it's one of the most beautiful reverbs you ever heard. Wow. Just his cymbals and his toms are tuned so perfectly yeah. that it's like a beautiful reverb. Which is also a great point that people rarely talk about. People yeah. worry so much about getting drum sounds. It starts with the tuning of the drums. Yeah. But like, but if you're gonna like working on your own stuff, and you know, if you know you're just gonna be doing a boom, gada, boom, boom, gada, boom, gada, boom, that kind of thing. Well, don't put up toms. If they're mm -hmm. not part of the tune, you know, there's no reason for them to be there for most most of the time. Sometimes the toms add something cool. But, you know, especially people who have less experience who are struggling to get great drum sounds. Um, and there might be something coming from me about this soon online. But, um, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, when you're struggling with it, just strip it down. Yeah. You know, if you if it's all kick and snare all the way through... Well, do kick and snare, and you know, if with just that, you can get amazing drum sounds with two to three mics. And it's just when you all of a sudden have, oh, you've got four rack toms, two floor toms, and all of that, then you really need the more advanced skills to try and deal with. Dang, bring up how the, much that's fighting. The, the tom mics and just listen to them soloed, and, and when they're not being played, you'll hear, woo, 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 woo. and yeah. talk about muddying up your mix. Yeah. You know, if you're doing a jazz record and you want that, great. But most of the time for a pop or a rock record, yeah. you don't need And the it. important thing about that that pe people with less experience don't really think through is that whoa, 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 going through that is screwing up our articulation of the lead vocal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's bearing the lead vocal. It's making it more difficult to hear the passing tones that the bass player plays. Absolutely. So it's not all about, oh, is, it, is the kick drum sounding is cool now but it's is the piano sounding good because if you have toms that are just going whoa, whoa, the voicings inside the piano parts yeah. are going to get more obscured yeah because um they're going to be out of phase there, there's going to be a phase relationship between those mm -hmm. two sounds and it's going to be constantly changing mm -hmm. depending on what the piano player yeah. is playing so to, all these things go into making great sounds people always want the easy answer to how do i make my stuff sound slick it's being knowing enough about the physics of sound in yeah. the room mm -hmm. to be smart enough to take the toms out of the room if you don't need them. Yeah, and, but even if you think like taking that one step further, if you want to hear this in action, just that ooh, going all the way through, just pull up one of your favorite mixes from your favorite band in the world, mm -hmm. pull it into your DAW, and then just take a virtual synth and just go take pick two random keys and just go ooh, through the whole mix and see how much right. that improves your mix because that's what's <laughs> happening it's it's the exact same thing because when those drums are just droning along you know they are pitched instruments just, that just go yeah. which is no different than you taking your favorite record from Led Zeppelin or Madonna and just going all the way through it absolutely I mean these are killer tips you guys so to get more of them at the road rally which is coming up a week from thursday november 5th through the 8th 8th at the weston lax and by the way we know that a lot of people will take like last year's road rally badge and scan it and change the date 
or just show up with no badge at all because we don't charge for the event. But in order to win prizes, you got to be in the database, number one. Um, number two, we're putting something on the badges this year that lets us know if you, something that can't be scanned that um, will let us know if you're real or not. And you can't go to the mentor lunches if you're not in the database and mostly the drawings. You, if you don't have a ticket stub, you and can't. And it's lame. Win. It is lame, but people do it. <laughs> there are a lot of former members, and I see them at the road rally. Hey, Michael. Hey, Michael. They walk by, and then I realize they weren't wearing a badge. Mm -hmm. And then somebody once said to me, do you have any idea, however many people you've got in the database for the rally, there are hundreds more that show up that aren't even members. I mean, do I really want to hire security guys to check badges at, door, at the doors like they do at the expo and some of the other events? At some point, we're going to have to. So... Be a mensch. That's all. That's all I'm asking. Be a friggin' mensch. All right. We got a boogie because we've been doing this now for an hour and a half. Always a great pleasure having you yeah, on the show. Yeah, awesome. And and come hang out in the booksellers room. I do the road rally because I love to meet everybody. Yep. Uh, the so. booksellers room, just so you know, is just keep walking past the ballroom. And it's the fourth set of ballroom doors. And we've got a nice big room with, I don't know, like 10 or 12 tables set up there with wonderful people like Roman hanging out. Yeah. Um, all right. I will see you guys. If you haven't looked at the road rally schedule yet, uh, look at all this stuff to see the list of the mentors, all that stuff. Go to taxi.com in the center of taxi.com. You'll see a thing that says taxis free convention. Click on that. And that will take you to a page that shows you the bios of all the mentors, which will blow your mind. The bios of the teachers, which will blow your mind. It shows you a description of all the classes being taught, which will blow your mind. It shows you a grid of when the classes are being taught, which will blow your mind. And it shows you the panels in the main ballroom, which will blow your mind. I'm telling you. So it's not about the work that goes into it. It's when we get done with it, like we did a week ago. We looked at ourselves, you know, Angel and I looked at each other and went, holy crap. I mean, this is really good. There's some other large scale conventions out there that can't hold a candle to it. And we don't charge you for it. So, you know, anybody, especially if you live in L.A., Orange, Ventura County, and you are a taxi member and you do not come to the road rally because you're going to sit at home and smoke dope and watch TV on Saturday... You're missing out. Yeah. I, 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 it's life-changing. Anybody who goes will tell you that. So come to the Road Rally. Yeah. We will see you there. We're going to have a blast. Um, no parties on the roof this year. I hate getting called by security at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and no parties in the executive lounge uh, upstairs because I really hate going down there in my gym shorts and T-shirt 3 o'clock in the morning, finding 200 taxi members in there. Um, the place stinks like a bar and... It looks like a hell of a party, but I just hate getting in trouble from the hotel. <laughs> so don't do that either. We will see you November 5th through the 8th. And your website again, sir, is? Re uh, recordingbootcamp.com. And I did look at all the stuff to make sure nobody else had the words boot camp in it this Thank year. You. Because he has it trademarked. <laughs> um, see you guys soon for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Robin Frederick will be here next week. And then it's Road Rally time right after that. Take care, you guys. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.